So this is another point where we'll change gears for a while here and talk about harmful algal blooms. Now harmful algal blooms sometimes refer to the buildup of algae to the point at which some limiting nutrient is insufficient and then they die and you wind up with a dead zone. This can be in a stream, can be in a large lake, and certainly can be along the ocean, the coastal part of the ocean. But for the, today, let's talk more about toxic cyanobacteria, other toxigenic species that are important, especially in the marine ecosystem and in estuaries, are dinoflagellates and diatoms. But this is a big topic, so we're going to focus only on some of the more prominent cyanobacterial toxins. These have caused problems in freshwater lakes and reservoirs and in slow-moving streams, occasionally in the ocean as well. In this case, I show a picture here of Lake Erie and an algal bloom there. And in recent years, communities have been told not to drink the water because of microcystin contamination. This is a toxic compound, one of the more important ones that comes from cyanobacteria. And this graph in the lower left-hand corner shows the bloom severity index. And it's pretty substantial there in recent years. Here on the lower right is a figure taken from an article that was published not so long ago about a reservoir in Brazil. And in this case, people were dialyzed with water from the reservoir that was used to make dialysate solution. Some of the water was not properly treated and the microcystins were there and they went into the people as their nitrogenous wastes were being removed. A bunch of people died from that. 116 were poisoned and 26 died from acute liver failure. Many others had chronic liver failure as a result. These toxins have to be taken seriously. Nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, are drivers of problems in aquatic ecosystems. Nitrate, for example, is directly toxic. It can cause methemoglobin production and it can be an endocrine disruptor as well. These nutrients, when they build up, can cause the hypoxic dead zones we mentioned. And in dead zones, you can also have problems of botulism. And where you have excess periphyton, where there is sufficient oxygen, you can get more snails, so therefore more trematode infections as snails are the intermediate hosts where asexual reproduction occurs and the trematode parasites. And of course, then the harmful, the toxic algal blooms. So where do the nutrients come from? Deforestation, as you see in this aerial photograph, this satellite photograph of roads moving into the Amazon. Deforestation frees up nutrients. Burning croplands, which is done widely, also releases nutrient dumps into the environment. Fertilizing crops, fertilizing lawns, golf courses, these are additional sources. Mismanagement of human and animal waste leaves nutrients free to run into water bodies. And fossil fuel burning that releases nitrogen oxides can add to algal bloom problems as well. The stagnant water with dams, water removal so that streams are not, have not so much to move along. Uh, these also can set the stage for problems, especially toxic algal blooms. So keep in mind that these problems are far from controlled right now. There's a lot of work to be done. This slide shows some common errors in management that lead to problems, as well as some areas where interventions have been implemented to lessen those problems. So septic tanks too close to the water, not well maintained, crops too close to the water, animals too close to the water, erosion, fertilization that's excessive, too much clearance of the land, scalding the land, overgrazing the land, all of these can lead to problems. A lack of cover crops is another one. On the other hand, putting the cover crops in managing the riparian area along the stream well, conservation farming, proper plowing, and wide buffers. These things can make a huge difference in lessening the problems of escape of nutrients into the aquatic ecosystem. Keep in mind that algal blooms result from this kind of mismanagement. 
and that they are aggravated by climate change. Excess CO2 and methane warm the earth, and then with that warmer temperature comes shorter generation times of many harmful algal bloom organisms. Here's a satellite image of Lake Erie, and the larger photograph is the inset in the smaller one. You can see a boat that's traveling across this algal bloom. This is an algal bloom that's dominated by microcystis, which is a major producer of microcystins. Microcystins are toxic to cattle, dogs, wild mammals, birds, and fish. Their structure was first identified in the 1980s. Now there are many of them that have been identified, as well as closely related nodularins that are produced by nodularia. This slide shows two publications on the discovery of new microcystins. 16 new microcystins were identified from this one algal bloom in East Central Illinois. The point here is that previous to this, these toxins were totally unknown and they could have easily been missed. So the point is, it's important to take algal bloom materials that you suspect as having caused a problem to the laboratory, to a group that specializes in determining structures so they can either find a known structure or identify something new altogether. That way, it's possible to make a diagnosis thereafter, and that's really important. One of the microcystin producers that's most often encountered is microcystis. Here's a light photomicrograph at high power of microcystis. Oftentimes, you'll see a clear coating around the cells. Among other species, lesser flamingos have been poisoned by microcystins. These are obligate algivores. They subsist on nutrients from cyanobacteria as their mainstay diet. And in different parts of East Africa where they are so common, poisoning incidents have been significant. One way to determine whether you might have a cyanobacterial problem at hand is to look under the microscope at the organisms that are in the source material. So here's a, another microsystem producer, Planktothrix. Now Planktothrix was previously called Oscillatoria. So you might see it in the literature under either one of those names as the genus. Here's a different looking microsystem producer, Anabina, and it too has changed its name. Now it's called Dolichospermum or Spherospermopsis. As we'll see later, even though it can produce microsystems sometimes, it is often known for its neurotoxins present. Microcystins and nodularins are hepatotoxins, and the animals often die from hemorrhage into the liver, sometimes generalized hemorrhage, from hypoglycemia, or from hyperkalemia, or other forms of liver failure. These slides are from research that helped in the understanding of how microcystin damages the liver. Instead of the normal hepatic plates of cells that you have, in the upper left-hand corner, you see that the hepatocytes are already separating, so they look like cobblestones. In the upper right, you have intrahepatic hemorrhage. The sinusoids are beginning to fall apart, so the animal is already experiencing some pretty severe problem. In the lower left, the hemorrhage has become extensive. Now, oftentimes, the hepatocytes will wash out and you may be left with only a few layers of hepatocytes in the outermost part of the lobule. And what you see in this vessel looks like hepatocytes that are leaving the liver. And indeed, in the lower right, you have pulmonary arterioles with intact hepatocytes in them. So these effects are devastating and can easily lead to the death of animals and people as well. Here is a news story about cyanobacteria, microcystis in particular, that killed a whole range of wildlife species in Kruger National Park, the largest national park of South Africa. One of the hazards of providing water holes for animals is that rather than migrating around and spreading out trying to find water, they'll all come to the same place. They'll stay there, they'll urinate, they'll defecate, they'll enrich the water source, and therefore a cyanobacterial bloom can arise. In this problem at Kruger Park, 
There were a lot of hippos, and there were a lot of other species as well. A total of 52 animals died, especially wildebeest and zebra, an endangered white rhinos and cape buffaloes, but also some lions and cheetahs, and a giraffe, a hippo, kudu, and a warthog. The southern sea otter along the coast of California was almost driven to extinction by hunters in the 1800s seeking its pelts. Hunting was ceased after that, but the species has struggled to come back. In part, this is because of toxoplasma from cat feces, sarcocystis from opossum feces, and demoic acid from diatoms, another harmful algal bloom. And recently, there's been an additional problem, microcystis. In this case, there was a nutrient-rich pond near the coast, which overflowed into a stream and down the river into the bay where clams, oysters, and mussels picked up the microcystis and therefore the otters picked up the microcystins. Net pens are used to raise fish in open waters, especially along the coasts. In this case, salmon have been poisoned by microcystins and the residues have been found, the lesions have been found, so the diagnosis is not in question. But on the other hand, the source is unknown. It remains to be determined. Previously, I mentioned Anabina and gave you its newer names. And we mentioned that it can produce microcystins, but also that it produces neurotoxins. So let's change gears just for a few minutes and talk about some cyanobacterial neurotoxins and how important they are. This shows my first field investigation of a case of cyanobacterial poisoning with a colleague, another student, and with a uh, veterinarian who was a practitioner in the area and a swine producer, and some pigs had died. And we went down there to figure out what might be causing it. And we found this anabina. Anabina spiroides was identified in concert with a person who was an expert in cyanobacteria. We also saw this blue vomitus on the soil. And the animals, when they were pulled away from the water, the death losses stopped. Now we know some of the toxins that are possible from anabina. And they include anatoxin A, which is nicotinic, the first discovered one, uh, and then anatoxin A sub S, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor. And in addition, some of the anabinas can produce saxitoxin, a sodium channel blocker, which is often associated with marine problems in a syndrome called paralytic shellfish poisoning. On the right side of this slide, you'll see that anatoxin A has been found in many different places. It's an important neurotoxin. Remember that it acts like nicotine. And homoanatoxin A, you see the two structures in the upper left? They're very similar in the way they act. They do the same sorts of things. So nicotinic paralysis, skeletal muscles become paralyzed. They may initially twitch and tremor, and the animals become paralyzed and they can't breathe. So here are some of the producers that you see. An anabina, or you can use the newer names if you like, an aphanosomenon, and an planktothrix, or oscillatoria, as well as a formidium, a rifidiopsis, and a cylindrospermum. Very different looking cyanobacterial species. Many of them can produce the same toxins. So this one can be a little difficult to nail down. You won't be able to do it just on the basis of morphology, but you'll need analyses for toxin concentration as well. Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned neonicotinoid insecticides and how like nicotine, they open sodium channels so that sodium gets in and impulses are carried on. And in this case, excessive impulses. And that's true with anatoxin A as well. And like nicotine, like the neonicotinoids, it's not broken down by acetylcholinesterase. So cholinesterase assays will be normal. Species will be affected across the board. This will kill dogs, it will kill ruminants, it will kill other species, birds within minutes sometimes, and certainly within hours. It depends on the dose.
hoisting by anatoxin A or homoanatoxin A results in a depolarizing blockade and respiratory paralysis. Lesser flamingos have been poisoned by anatoxin A. In an early study, cattle given anabina with anatoxin A were ventilated for more than 24 hours, but they did not recover the ability to breathe on their own. This was almost certainly due to continued absorption from the cells, the cyanobacterial cells in the GI tract. So death is not uncommon and treatment is not a panacea. We have done some other research in which we showed that the effects of the toxin in laboratory animals were pretty readily reversed. So we think that if you were able to get the toxin out of the digestive tract with lavage and activated charcoal, you might well keep the animal alive and it might survive. This is certainly worth a try. Anatoxin A sub S has an entirely different structure it's not a nicotinic agent. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor. It's the only known naturally occurring organophosphorus cholinesterase inhibitor. It's also very different in its fate in the body. It's very water soluble. It cannot cross some of the membranes in the body, so it cannot get into the brain and into the retina. So it does not inhibit cholinesterase there. It works strictly in the periphery. We've seen poisoning problems, and others have as well, and including problems in dogs and in swine and in ducks. These and other species have been poisoned by anatoxin A sub S. Birds may also be poisoned by anatoxin A sub S. This photograph is of a bird that died right beside an algal bloom with apparent scavenger impact. We think it was likely due to the rapid action of anatoxin A sub S and therefore it was just laying there or flopping around when along came a predator. Swine had died in this pond and so we were able to figure out that it was a source of anatoxin A sub S. Anatoxin A sub S is a very readily hydrolyzed molecule and when that occurs it loses its toxicity. We believe that ruminants are resistant to anatoxin A sub S because the toxin is hydrolyzed in the rumen. In any case, we do know that when ruminants are dosed intravenously with a lysate of anabina containing anatoxin A sub S, they can be poisoned by it. So we assume that the toxin is just not absorbed in its active form when they ingest it. On the other hand, anatoxin A sub S, as we mentioned, kills monogastrics within minutes. It's very rapid, and blood and muscle cholinesterase activities will be very low, whereas brain and retinal cholinesterase activities will be normal. So this is a case where it inhibits the acetylcholinesterase, as shown in the diagram. So an excess of acetylcholine opens sodium channels and causes all of this problem, including depolarizing blockade of the muscles of respiration. It will oftentimes be vomiting, excessive salivation, diarrhea, and tremors before the lethal outcome. This slide from the PhD studies of Dr. Bill Cook shows that in anesthetized rats dosed with anatoxin A sub S, their phrenic nerve amplitudes increased, but their diaphragmatic EMG, electromyogram activity, their muscle activity, decreased at the same time. This confirmed that respiratory paralysis is the cause of death from anatoxin A sub S. Saxitoxins are best known for their association with paralytic shellfish poisoning in people. Wildlife can also be affected. The source in that case of the shellfish contamination is marine dinoflagellates. But cyanobacteria, including anabina, ephanazomenon, cylindrus permopsis, and lingbia, which often occurs on the coast of marine ecosystems, can also cause saxitoxin poisonings. This shows some producers of saxitoxins, including some images of aphanazomenon, as well as Anabena circinalis, which contaminated over a thousand kilometers of the Darling River in Australia back in 1991.
In that case, it was not just one type of cyanobacterial toxins, but it was actually two. Both saxitoxins and anatoxin A were present in that bloom, and that was a serious problem. The action of saxitoxins is straightforward. They block voltage-gated sodium channels, so there's no depolarization. That's the basis for the respiratory paralysis and death. Of course, cholinesterase values would be unaffected. They would be in the normal range. Avian vacuolar myelinopathy is a disorder that often kills coots and has killed predatory birds like bald eagles that feed on the coots. It's associated with a cyanobacteria that grows on an exotic invasive water plant called hydrilla. It may also grow on other macrophyte plants in the water as well. So the coots are directly poisoned by eating those plants with the cyanobacteria on board. The toxin, however, the toxin remains to be identified. This is another area that needs additional research.